Okay, so I'd like to invite everybody to close your eyes and take a nice big deep breath. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do because he who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me. I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. Amen. All righty. So we have been working on the section in the course of Mass Hero, which we will go to shortly. But I do want to mention that last week Bob Wolf asked me how old Ken Wapnick was when he passed away, and I said he was 66. And as soon as I said it, it just didn't feel quite right. And so I did look it up and I was incorrect. He died when he was 71, not 66. My brother died when, I was, when he was 66. So I'm guessing I transposed those two. But he passed away in 2013 at 71. So I apologize for the mistake. And for Dan, uh, Ken Wapnick is, I don't know if you know a lot about the history of the course that Helen and Bill were the two people that brought the course into, I guess you could say into existence. And after the course was already um, done, then Ken was the first person that showed up on the, on the scene, I guess you could say. And he eventually began to teach classes and I had the great fortune of spending a lot of time with his classes and going to his teachings and whatnot. So I really honor what I was able to learn from his, his, um, his teachings. So just so you have a little background with that. Um, and before we go into the hero of the dream, I do have a couple other things I wanted to comment on as well. And I know last week, I believe it was, uh, Jason asked the question, you know, so should we like, I don't know if ex what the exact words were, but should we kind of like try to ignore our feelings or ignore our body and pretend that's not there? And I do want to make a reference to a, a quote in the course where it says, the body is merely part of your experience in the physical world. Its abilities can be and frequently are overrated. However, it is impossible to deny its existence in the world. Those who do so are engaging in a particularly unworthy form of denial. And the way the course is set up is when we separated from the love of God and we had the guilt, sin, and fear in our minds, we then projected it into the world. And then I had the experience of believing I was an innocent victim and others were, or other things or other people were my perpetrators or the people that um, bump up against me and make me feel like I've lost my peace. And literally, we don't want to deny the body because the body is our barometer. It's, it's showing us that I have lost my peace or I can lose my peace. And oftentimes it comes through a person, a place, a situation, an experience. It doesn't matter what form it comes in. But this becomes, my, my relationship with this becomes my barometer to help me remember that I must have chosen for the ego instead of for the Holy Spirit. So we really don't want to deny the body. We don't want to pretend I'm not affected by something that really is causing me to lose my peace. We really want to use that to help us remind ourselves that I have chosen incorrectly. And then it goes on, it says, uh, the body is a learning device for the mind. Learning devices are not lessons in themselves. Their purpose is merely to facilitate learning. So we will facilitate our learning through the use of our body, even though throughout the course, there are many quotes of the idea of I'm not a body, I am free, I am as God created me. And the, from the perspective of the course, God's creation has nothing to do with the body. It has to do with the Son of God as a spirit, which is extended from the love of God. 
but because we've projected into the world and we now believe we are in the world in time and space and that I have a body and my body is in relationship to other people and other circumstances and situations, I need to use those for a different purpose. And that different purpose is rather than using them as my um, projection of what I don't want to look at in my mind, it's used as a reminder to um, connect with the fact that if I can lose my peace in any way, it has to mean I've chosen for the ego. And that's a very good piece of information for me to become aware of, because the only way I can heal the situation is to understand where it's hiding and where it's hiding is in my mind that I'm totally unaware of because I'm always focused on what the body is. Right. Yes, a question or anything about that? Um, I have a comment. Um, yes, go for it. That's so right. I get to that point of seeing that what I'm seeing outside is in my mind. Correct. Um, I can get to that point when I stop judging it, which is asking for the Holy Spirit for help. Right. Because then I can look at it. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't want to know. You know, yeah. and, and so I'm pointing fingers everywhere. Um, I, I'm starting to experience some of that, which is incredibly helpful. Because mm -hmm. um, that phrase comes to mind uh, quite a bit lately. You know, what I, the, the world I see is an outside picture of an inward condition. Uh, that's... What's going on out out there seemingly is is bringing that up a lot. Yes. So um, I can look at it a lot easier than I used to. I'm not. I'm still not saying it's always easy, but it's becoming easier. Yes. And I think that's the progression of the process of practicing the course. Initially, yes. what are you talking about? And that quote that you used was one that Ken used very frequently. And the quote again is the out, the world is an outward projection of the inward thought, which is the thought comes from here. It gets projected out into the world. This becomes my, not only my classroom, but it becomes you know, sort of like I like to think of it. If, if you're a small child and you're learning how to read, obviously you can have the book in front of you, but you can, can't read very well. And then you learn a few words and then you can start to piece those words together and begin to read what was in front of you the whole time. Well, literally the world is an outward projection of what's going on in your mind. And when we chose to separate what was going on in our mind was guilt and in fear, kill or be killed and the belief in separation. So that's what I see splintered out into the world of which I think I'm an innocent victim. So as Rose was just saying, she's now using the world for a different purpose to see that what is going on outside my world is coming from the thought that's in my mind. And when I can come to that realization, then I can begin to choose differently. As long as I'm just in this little square here and I'm just a, an innocent victim of circumstances beyond my control, I'm brain dead. There's no hope. There's no way out of understanding this. But as I start to use what the ego set up for that different purpose, the healing can begin to occur, which is a wonderful thing. You know, Marianne, yes. uh, what, what seems to be coming up for me is that I'm I'm cursing myself for seeing separation everywhere. Okay. It's making me realize that it's the ego that's doing the cursing, obviously. I'm not with the Holy Spirit or even close. Right. Yep. Okay, but, but, but beautiful comment. I mean, I know that's, that's where all of us begin. It's like, this is what's been going on since the beginning of time, literally. So now we're becoming intellectually aware of it. So what does the ego do? It uses that little piece of information and it browbeats us and, and says, oh, how dare you doing this? Well, this is what egos do. Egos are made from this list of things, which I need to free blue that, but whatever. Um, this is what the ego is made of. So when we're asked to stop coming from the character Jason and begin to observe the world from above as Jason in relationship to the world, 
we are simply being asked to look at what was set up at the Big Bang, which has continued to be played out all the time. It's just now because you're becoming aware of it, the ego uses that to make you feel guilty instead of simply, I'm watching the play and this is what the play appears to be. And understand that the play is not even real. It just seems to be real. And so the ego is just kind of using it against you instead of for you. So do your best to observe it, but not judge it. And that takes practice. Um, hello. I hear voices. Mary. Um, this is Don. Hi, Don. I'm just going to try to I tell Jason one of the things is the uh, if you look at the atonement prayer on page 90 where it talks about I do not feel guilty because the Holy Spirit can or will undo all consequences of my wrong decision if I will let him right and to me that tells you when you go to that other side, you just, you're in the Holy Spirit. It changes, like Rose says, it changes the world. Yep. That you see. Because Good. of the, it's, it, it, it's in a different place. Right. And, and again, I think about that, you know, this is the way I look at this. Whenever we first start in the course, it's like walking into a room that's so full of fog, and we, we're gonna call that fog sin, guilt and fear, okay? And when we walk in that room, you know, all the furniture and people are in there, and, but we can't see, so we bump into things and knock things over and whatever. And as we begin to keep practicing the process of the course, that fog starts to lift, and slowly we can see images slightly, and then eventually the fog clears out completely, and we can see everything that was there all, all along, and we can see it perfectly clear. And that's kind of what happens in this process. But initially, when we walk in the door and begin to practice, just like Jason was saying, you know, I'm doing what it's asking me to do, but I'm, I'm, I'm hating myself the whole time because I'm identifying, you know, with the character Jason, even though I'm sort of starting to peek up here and observe it, I still am identified with the Jason. And so the guilt and fear is still part of the, of the experience. But that will slowly dissipate and you'll be able to actually just observe it oh. and not judge it. But thanks for pointing that out, Don, because that's a good line there to really explain that. Mary. Yes. Mary Ann. Yes. Um, I just recently started saying um, when my mind is being very self-critical or judgmental or just going OCD uh, that I say to myself, this is not who I really am. This is beautiful. It's not, it's not who I really am. It's. Right my ego and that there is a, a divine presence in everyone that is, sits behind a silent watcher and so I try to just say to myself that this is not really who I am so that sort of helps me right. and and that's that again, you wouldn't have that awareness of that thought even pop in your head if you were totally enmeshed in the character called she Shelley it's, it's like, these are little indications that I'm starting to, you know, rise above the battleground more and more frequently, because that wouldn't even come to my mind if I was totally enmeshed in my ego completely. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a great, great practice as well. Was, was there another voice I was hearing? Nope. Okay. All right, so I'm going to actually move to workbook lesson. Well, actually, it's not workbook lesson. It's a workbook part two, uh, section five. It's, it's the question, what is the body? If anybody wants to go to the book, it would be in the workbook session section. Let me see if I can find the page real quick. Sorry, I didn't have that ready. 425, Marianne. 425, okay. And it is, what is the body, right? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so I'm, get, I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to read parts of it. So the first paragraph says, The body is a fence the Son of God imagines he has built to separate parts of his self from other parts. It is within this fence he thinks he lives to die as it decays and crumbles. 
for within this fence, he thinks that he is safe from love. Identifying with his safety, he regards himself as what his safety is. How else could he be certain he remains within the body, keeping love outside? So I think it's an interesting statement that Jesus is basically saying the body is a fence the Son of God imagines he has built to separate parts of his self, capital S, from other parts. And I oftentimes give like a little demonstration here. Let me just get it on the board here. Of, you know, like this is everything, this entire board. And then we build little fences around parts of that. And so I call myself this, and this one's Rose, and this is Don, and this is Bob, or whoever we, we are. And so now it appears that instead of everything being one, we have these individual little pieces and parts. And I hone in on this little individual part, and I call that me. And that makes me special. It makes me different. It makes me different than the individuals that are around me. And as we have gone over many times with the Course, when we separated from the Son of God, we, we did it because God gave us everything and we were an effect of what God gave us. And so we were at oneness, God was on the throne, we had love and peace, eternity, Christ, um, joy, innocence, and we were all the same. And God gave us all his gifts. The only gift that God could not give us was to be us to be the creator. But we wanted to be the creator. So what we did is decided to split off in our minds. It was just a thought. It didn't technically really happen, though it does certainly feel like it happened. Um, and we splintered off as a separated son, collectively all as one at that time. We then had the belief that we did something bad to God, basically kill off oneness, because if you live in an experience of two-ness, oneness no longer exists. So we had guilt, sin, and fear, separation, and a killer be killed. And we really believed we pulled this off. So God gave the answer, or the Holy Spirit gave the answer, which was the Holy Spirit, that said nothing happened, come back home. But we were afraid to go back home because we had this guilt, sin, and fear in our mind. So we projected our guilt, sin, and fear out into the world, outside of us, so we could play the part of an innocent victim. Now, outside of us goes beyond just our understanding of outside of us, because even my thoughts are outside of me, of who I really am. My physical body is outside of who I really am. And my physical body can have ailments or problems or illnesses, but they're all still coming from the thought in the mind that believes in separation. Because the thought coming from love has to do only with love and the extension of love and all the attributes that I read before. So when we split off, chose the opposite of love, we now believe in separation. There's a me and a God. And then as we project it into the world, there's a me and a something else and that something else appears to be the problem that takes my peace away. And with that, we have guilt, sin, fear, death, projection, and difference. So this is what we got as a result of choosing for the separation. And I also get an individual self as I project it into the world. And now I'm in opposition to the other individual selves that are floating around in the world. And each one of these individual selves has a limited awareness of what is, because each one of us have built this little fence around this small, um, what do we call it, separate part of the self. So the self is all of this. The little self is the individualized part of me that I have accepted as who I am. So when he says the body is a fence the Son of God imagines he has built, and I'll stop right there because it says the Son of God imagines that he has built. In truth, it's not real. And in truth, nothing that happens here will ever affect what happens here. So we, we believe that we've separated and this has happened or we've imagined it. 
to separate parts of his self from other parts. So again, there's a me and then there's other parts. So we're gonna to move to paragraph three. The body is a dream and we know we've been talking about the concept of the dream and there's bodies in the dream of which I'm the main character or the main body in the dream. I still don't figure out where you're at. Oh, we are in workbook. What was the page, Marty? <laughs> well, you're in the workbook. I'm in the workbook. What page? Oh, I'm sorry, I stepped away for a second. It's on page uh, 425, 425 in the workbook. What was it? 425. 425 in the workbook. Sorry, Don. Okay. I'm going to write that down too. Okay, so paragraph number three. The body is a dream. And for Dan, what I usually do is read the paragraph and then I walk through uh, line by line. So we're in paragraph three. The body is a dream. Uh, in dreams, it sometimes seems to picture happiness but can quite suddenly revert to fear where every dream is born. For only love creates in truth and truth can never fear. Made to be fearful, must the body serve the purpose given it. But we can change the purpose that the body will obey by changing what we think that it is for. Okay, so the course talks diligently, frequently, and often that, the, that we are in a dream. We're having a dream. Um, and as Rose said a few minutes ago, the, just as when you go to a therapist, oftentimes they will take your dreams and evaluate them and try to help you understand that every character in your nighttime dream is associated with some aspect of yourself. And if you think about it, if your mind is the one dreaming this dream at night, of course all the characters have to come from your mind so they have to be a reflection of you. Well, the course takes it another step and tries to help us understand that our daytime dream is exactly the same as our nighttime dream. And the daytime dream refers to the concept of when we were projected into the world, we projected it in from our mind, the Son of God who believes he's separated. And when the Son of God believes he's separated, what is his mind made of? Guilt, sin, and fear, death projection and we're all different. So our world is then going to reflect all those attributes. And as this chart says, form, hate, void, emptiness, illusions, uncertainty, death, dread, time, guilt, chaos, fear, lack, intensity, pain, and then of course special love and special hate relationships, but we're not going to go into today. But special love and hate relationships are basically, we know we hate some people in the world because they don't do things the way we think they should. Or we have what they call special love relationships, which is a special person or people, or maybe it could be your government in relationship to another government. We join forces and this is special. But if anyone within the context of that special relationship shifts and changes their opinion or the way they act with you or treat you, suddenly that special love relationship turns into a special hate relationship. So basically a special love relationship is a special hate relationship which has been covered over with a, with a nice veneer that says, I love you, but there's, it's usually a contract rather than a true exchange of unconditional love. That was a lot to be said there. <laughs> All right, so, oops. so again, in paragraph three, the body is a dream. Like other dreams, it sometimes seems to picture happiness, but can quite suddenly revert to fear where every dream is born. And the way that the dreaming concept of the nighttime dream and the daytime dream is set up is there are good dreams and there are some bad dreams. But within the context of a dream, whether it's a nighttime dream or a daytime dream, you always get the roller coaster ride of both of those. We all know you have good moments in your life and you have some pretty rough moments in your life. But you seldom ever have just isn't everything wonderful all the time, which is because we live in a world of duality and in duality, 
you get both of them. That's the bag we bought. Only in oneness do we experience oneness. In duality, you get both sides. And we're constantly doing our best as uh, people in the world to fix the world, to make the world be in a way where it's nice for me all the time. I don't know about the rest of you, but I haven't done very well at accomplishing that. And I doubt if anyone else in the world has because the world wasn't made to be oneness and love. It was made to be the opposite of all of that. Only we didn't realize that. And we've been, as the Course said, seeking but not finding how to make the world okay and good for me all the time. Because it's impossible to take a flawed world made from guilt, sin, fear, separation, and death and make it into a happy dream within the context of the dream of the ego. It's only when we can let go of the dream of the ego and align with the Holy Spirit that we can eventually find our way back to the memory of the truth of who we really are. All right, so again, within this dream, we're gonna have some happy dreams or appear to be happy dreams, and then suddenly it can revert to fear. You know, how many times have you looked forward to going somewhere and doing something, and then something just didn't work out the way it was supposed to be, and the disappointment and upset starts to come to the surface. For, for if his oneness still remained untouched, who could attack and who could be attacked? And what that means is if we were still aligned with truth, there wouldn't be something or someone to attack or be attacked because in oneness, there's nothing to attack against. Okay, so he's asking how could there be an attacker in the place of oneness? And the answer is there couldn't be because in oneness, Nothing can attack something else because there isn't anything to be able to attack from. Made to be fearful, must the body serve the purpose given it? Well, the world is made as the choice of the opposite of oneness and wholeness. It's made out of fear. I believe I've done something horrible to exist in this world of separation. Fear is the birth point, I guess you could say. Guilt, sin, and fear are the, the main characteristics and death and belief and separation and everything are the foundational blocks that bring forth the dream or the separated experience and state. All right, who could be victor? Who could, who could be his prey and who could be victim? Who could be the, oops, I'm reading paragraph two. All right, I guess I'm supposed to read paragraph two. All right, so who could be the victor? Who could be the prey? Who could be the victim? Who could be the murderer? There couldn't be. It wouldn't, it wouldn't exist. It wouldn't be possible. Because if we were in our right mind, it doesn't exist. It's not a possibility. So what he's really trying to help us do is to recognize you've chosen separation. You've chosen a world against the truth of who you are in truth. It's good for you to become aware of that because in order for you to undo it, to remember, to be reminded to go back home is to realize that what we chose really isn't a good deal. We thought I was gonna be an individual, I could be special, I could be different, and I could be basically God. And we did get all of that. We just had to leave love, connection, oneness, and eternity behind because we chose the opposite of what we are. And all right, and if he did not die, what proof is there that God, God's eternal son could be destroyed? So, you know, again, one of the ideas that we bought when we bought the separated state was death. This is a world where we're born and then we die. And not only we will have that experience, but literally every single, every single person on the planet will have that. And, and, and every single thing in the world is going to have a beginning and an ending. Even a mountain that may seem to last for a very, very long time will eventually die. <coughs> but again, the thought system of the ego 
came with the thought of death. We killed off what was once one to exist in what is now two or in duality. So we bought the package of death. And we want, and Jesus is saying, and if he did not die, what proof is there that God's eternal son could be destroyed? And the answer is nothing could prove it because nothing happened. We're still at one with the love mm -hmm. of God. Sorry, I switched paragraphs. Go ahead, uh, Sheila, or, uh, Shelley. Yeah, again, um, when we come into the world as a baby, yeah. we have this ego thought system yes, already in us. Yes, ma'am. And I know that's- I just you know, wanted to make sure. Opposed to the way we normally think in the world, you know, that baby's a sweet little innocent victim and, you know, they haven't done anything wrong and, you know, the world does whatever and that makes them become what they are. But the course has a, you know, total different mm -hmm. response to that. Literally, if you're here, it's because you've identified with this thought system and all the trappings that that comes forth with. Yeah. So even little tiny babies, just a day old, or whatever they have an ego they wouldn't come to a already separation if they were at one unless there's the very okay. rare examples of you know spiritual people that may have chosen to come to mm -hmm. um show us the way i guess you could say but the average teeny tiny one-year-old baby is filled with guilt sin and fear they wouldn't be here and again that's very different than you know the way we most of us look at a small child but if you think about it think about the child normally they come in screaming okay and um they will scream if they don't get their knees met well isn't that a good little ego in planet earth you know and and be also aware that we all came in as that seemingly innocent victim to set up the the plan of this process because we all know as a, as a tiny baby, literally none of us could have survived if we didn't have someone to take care of us, whether it was our parents or somebody else, we would physically have died without that someone taking care of us. So we, this whole thought system was set up before we took our first breath. And so to Kind of step on, step away from it and begin to examine it from a little different perspective takes a lot because everything within the context of the separated states supports this belief system, which of course it would support this belief system because it was made from the thought system to have this support and keep us brain dead and stay in the dream so that we wouldn't ever question, is there another way? But yeah, no innocent, no no innocent babies. <laughs> well, Marianne and the whole thing about oh, well, and the whole thing about dependency, yeah, and being a victim and not having my needs met. Absolutely, all set up day one. Uh, over Marianne, <laughs> Marianne. Yes, Bob, go. Oh, okay, uh, and then also when you die, when the body dies and you go on the other side, you still have your ego. Yes, good point, Bob. And that's a, always, I like to bring that up and remind people of that. A lot of times people think if I die, I'll go back to heaven. Well, the course says it slightly different, in fact, a lot different, that you're going to take your ego with you if you're still invested with the ego. You will just be taken off the body or it would be similar to taking off your coat if it was hot outside. Um, so you really, there's actually a line in the course I wish I could remember the exact words, but something to the effect, don't believe that because you die, that means you're there or you're done because you're not. And understand that the thought system came before the body came, okay? So if the body is still running in the thought system of the ego and it, you know, it, it body drops away, the thought system still intact. So dying is not the answer remembering who we really are is the answer. Very yeah, and it's helpful for me to, to, to remember that the mind is not in the body. The body is in the mind. Right. I'm watching a movie. Yes. When I quote unquote die, I'm just going to another channel. I'm putting, popping in another tape or DVD, whatever it is. Right. Yep. 
And again, this is all on a very subconscious level that while we're enmeshed in the dream, we never even question any of these things. I just, you know, was born, I popped in, it was my parents' fault, and you know, since then I got lots of other people that are my problem as well. But never, and there's a number of places the court says, never do we ever think that our choice for separation was what caused the effect that we're living in and the experience that we're living in. It, it, it's all set up because literally each one of these steps, when we were here and we chose to have the experience of separating and the answer was given, we looked at these two choices, decided on this one, closed the door to this one, forgot that was even a possibility. Then we took the guilt, sin, and fear, projected it into the world, and then closed the door to this memory. So all we lived in was this square that said, I'm an innocent victim. I was born that way, don't you understand? And I play that out in all different ways and all different um, experiences over and over in my life, never ever thinking that perhaps it was a setup, because it is a setup. And we don't know that until you drop your papers on the floor, no. <laughs> um, until so, so Marianne, yes. are, are the concept of soul contracts, is that an ego device? Yes. What? Who said what? What? Yeah. what? Soul contract, what is that? Well, I mean, yes, because there is no soul contract if you're at one, because there's no, we're all together, there's no individual. So, you know, the course even talks about the idea of, oh, what's the word usage? Um, oh, there's a theme or something to our life, but understand that every single theme is the same. It's get, it gets played out in different forms, but it's always, I'm an innocent victim of circumstances beyond my control. Even the the most horrendous murderer on the planet who many people would look at and say, well, they're not an innocent victim. They're guilty. They're guilty son of a guns. But they feel within themselves that they're an innocent victim of circumstances beyond their control. And the way they handle it is to go out and do things that most of us probably wouldn't do. But it is, um, it's all a setup. And anything that has to do with form in any way, shape, or form has to do with the ego. When, if the body dies, when it dies, yes. Yes. Um, so I was always, oh God, there's so many ways I would to go with that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what, what happens, what does the Course say, do you, if, if you come back and repeat until you're no longer with the ego? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So you'd come back in a different life until you get your shit together, kind of? Yes. Uh, you know, if that's the Course doesn't really talk a, a great deal specifically in regard to the concepts of reincarnation. There mm -hmm. is a section in the teacher's manual that does talk about the reincarnation. Um, but it does it does say in there, if you know, if you have an issue with reincarnation, don't don't let that stop you from practicing the course. But at the same time, throughout the course, there are very subtle mentions such as, you know, when you have a holy instant, which is basically connecting with your brother from here instead of from the body level, it's an ancient hatred that has turned into a present love. So, you know, it's not a requirement to believe in reincarnation, but it certainly lends itself in many many places to the concept of we we're just constantly recycling life because the game is i believe this is real and i don't believe this is real and so if i don't accomplish that in one lifetime of course i would probably likely come back until i re recognize that my true nature is who i am hey mary i just have a, a i don't know maybe we don't like the word soul contract but I, it kind of implies that Bill and Helen kind of had something that, that was unfinished. Mm -hmm. And then when you go to the teacher's manual, it talks about, I forget it. It's like in the beginning of it, it talks about, you have these, uh, these very yeah. casual relationships and the elevator and you have some that like, you know, I think it refers to maybe somebody that's your classmate and then you have somebody that's a lifetime. So, I mean, maybe well, we don't want to call that, uh, 
sole contracts, but in a yeah. roundabout way, isn't that kind of what it is? You're probably right, Marty. And it's, it, they, if, you know, this isn't necessarily coming from the course, but in metaphysics training that I've had, that between lifetimes, we will kind of go to a counselor. The counselor will go over what we accomplished and what we thought we were going to accomplish. And you could think of it as if I was going to a counselor and I wanted to become a nurse, that the counselor would guide me to take certain classes so that I could accomplish that. And let's say I got into the lifetime and yeah, I didn't think I wanted to do that this time because that just wasn't a whole lot of fun. And I still wanted to party a little bit. So I may not have accomplished that aspect of the undoing process of the ego. So when, I'm, when I go over, quote unquote, to the other side, I will be shown that there are things that I need to do to process through and understand this on a deeper level. So if you want to call that a contract, and there's a word in the course, help me out somebody, that, that talks about the idea of we come in with oh, scripts, that's the word it says, that we come in with scripts. Well, it's the same kind of thing, but ultimately the bottom line script is I believe in duality, I believe in separation, I believe I'm an innocent victim. So all the scripts, no matter what form they may take, all represent me being an innocent victim of circumstances beyond my control. I see your hand, Denise, go ahead. Hey. Uh, so guides or people that are more, I don't want to say evolved, but people that have, you know, been let, let go of the ego more from the spirit realm, do they, is that a projection to those guides? Yes, technically. I mean, Jesus is, 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 is. <laughs> um, and that doesn't mean they can't be helpful while we're in the dream because we believe, I mean, I believe I'm looking at this girl in the, in the square here named Denise. Right. So it, it's not that you discount the usage or the understanding of that, but literally it's all, I mean, there is no form. Okay. Very so bad. If we kind of like put it into that context, it becomes pretty easy. I'm either in form or space and time or I'm not. And yet, since I believe I'm in form, we're going to take the form as it's been set up and then begin to use it differently so that we can, you know, kind of release ourselves from the form and then align to truth. Classroom, like you always talk about, right? I mean, the course is called a course and there Right, there. right. Yeah. Just one other quick question. You know, we talked about Don, or I think Don, or Don Bro Pat brought up that we bring the ego with us, right? Well, so I think about it's not. The, I mean, that, those were the use of words that were used, but we are the ego. Thank you. Okay, nope. but and I just put some clothes on, and I call this my this body who I am now. Okay, but let me just ask you: What about the culmination of all the lives that you lived? In other words, do we recognize that when we quote unquote cross over that we are the culmination of all these different lives? And if so, how big must that ego be? Well, but, but think about, we've been accumulating this since the Big Bang. It's pretty big. But there's really only two aspects. I either believe in this or I don't believe in this. And I can call it a smaller or bigger because I've accumulated more of it. And there is a place at the very beginning of the course where it talks about the idea of there's a limit to how much pain you can tolerate. When we get to that, that, that point where I... I'm, I can't tolerate this place. I've tried to do all the things they tell me to do. I've been, been a good citizen. I've done this. I've done that. And I'm not very peaceful. I'm not, there's something, you know, something in my heart is missing. And at that moment's the moment we start to question, is there another way? Is there another possibility? And, you know, the course is a way that for many of us, you know, that kind of popped into our awareness and was trying to explore what that really means. The chances, chances are there will be a study in the course on the other side, and, and probably, and, and probably in a similar group. Yes, well, and my understanding again from metaphysics, not as much from the course. Um, they do say just like when you're in a you know grade school, you know all the kids in second grade move to the third grade, and then the fourth grade, and then the fifth grade, and you kind of stay with the same group. Once in a while, one child might go to the fifth grade because they're smarter, and another one might have to repeat second grade. But you know the people we 
kind of play with are familiar oftentimes because we have danced before. Bobby, can you still toss belief. to a tone on the other side? Well, <laughs> some people that's the belief in hierarchies. Easier to a tone on the other side because we're not as solid into the body, but I'm not going there. I mean, the course really doesn't talk a whole lot about that. But I, I look, yeah, go ahead. I look at it this way. <clears throat> I'm, I, I go to sleep tonight and I'm dreaming a dream, okay? okay? Whatever's going on, whatever's happening, good, bad, ugly, whatever, <clears throat> and then I wake up. That's a death, that's death. I'm okay. dead to that dream now. That dream is gone, it's dead. I'm, now I'm living this dream. Yep. And, and, and so on and so on and so on. Yep. Um, and, and all the beings, the higher beings, whatever I give the labels to, they're all part of the mind. Yep. Yep. What am I listening to? That's the only thing that I need to focus on here is who am I listening to? Yes. And I know that by my reaction. Right, right. And can, you know, the Course says it, Ken used to say it over and over and over. I'm either aligned with this or I'm aligned with this. And as Rose said, how do I know? Look at, look at how you are in this instant. You know, people say, oh, you know, I'm doing this pretty good and I've got myself together and whatever. I want to hear about when somebody walks in the room and says something to you that hurts your feelings or makes you upset. That's the moment that's telling, who am I aligned, what am I aligned with? And that's not to make you feel bad or to make you feel worse. Or as Jason was saying, you know, man, I'm looking and I'm seeing eh, a pretty picture. It's saying, if I'm aligned with the ego. That's a good piece of information. I need to know about that because the only way I could ever heal is to understand where I am. And instead of falling into the trap of, oh my gosh, I'm really terrible and I shouldn't be doing this. Simply stop. Wait a minute. If I'm in there, I need to stop and go over here. Where no matter what I'm in the midst of, stop this, go here. And then if you forget, stop this and then go here. That's really all there is to choose from. So when you say stop this and go here, do you just how do you go there? Recognize that this ain't working too good. I know it's not working too good. I got that part, but, but, uh, but how do I actually make that step to say, I mean, I can say help Holy Spirit, you know, I, I'm, you know, help please show me things differently, but that doesn't seem to. It doesn't, it's not magic. And, and, you know, we're real used to magic in this world. You know, we're used to turning on the TV with a button and it turns on or the toaster. Literally, and I want you guys to listen to this, literally every time you have that moment where you're conscious enough to say, help me see this differently, something is changing. Now the problem is, what's changing, well, I mean, it's not really a problem, it's a good thing, but what's changing is you're becoming more identified with this. But because we're still identified with this, I want this to make be nicer and be better and be prettier and be, you know, supportive of little miss mr jason in the middle of this room and that's not necessarily what's going to change but what it has changed is this is give, be, being given less less um i'm going to call this a bank account less change because i'm putting my change in over here but i come back over here and this doesn't look like much is different so i think oh well this isn't working you know i want i want my world to just turn out fantastic right now but it's really turning out and it's really working and it's we're really doing what you're being asked to do and then after working on this for a long time you may have a moment where something's really horrible going on and your mind will automatically shift to here and reflect love and you might even say and i know helene shared a story a week or two ago where she said you know i didn't even ask for help but then all of a sudden i saw my brother is different but that is a result of all that you put in the investment of choosing for the Holy Spirit. And, and I know it's, 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 it's hard to keep working on this where sometimes it doesn't appear that it's really making a big difference in what's going on in my experience. No, well, but when you're <laughs> in your right mind and you look at the ego, you will be at peace looking at the ego as long as you're in the right mind well 
you know, I would say that's true, but in the progression to getting to the point where I'm literally here and totally not invested in here, I can be doing what is being asked by looking, but I'm still pretty enmeshed in this and the results of what this is going to look like, which isn't ultimately over here, but it's probably the best we can do at this, at this moment in our journey. Right. I'm saying when you're over there 100%. Oh, when you're over here 100%, this will be just like watching kids on the floor playing. Right. right. You'll be totally at peace. Totally at peace. It's just the story that's going on, but I know this isn't who I am anymore. I, and also, I, I, I would throw in there, when you're asking for help, be aware of having an attachment to an outcome. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I recently, just a few weeks ago, was asking for help because I was feeling sick to my stomach and realized I was asking to feel better. Stop back to the drawing board. I don't know what this is for. Help me. Right. Period. Yep. And walk away. Go about your business. Yep. Because, you know, if you're attached to the, fixing the situation, that's not it. Or you are. Yeah. And, and most, in 99% of the time, we are, you know, yeah. I'm okay, or I've got this, fix this, and then we're, we'll be okay. I can go on my day. Well, this is about taking us to our, our, our real mind that knows that none of this is real. Well, we're not spiritually mature enough to completely embrace that, understand that, or accept that. So we keep working. And eventually, as Rose was saying, you can ask for help and know that I've done my part. It's not, in fact, there's places in the course where it says it's literally none of our business what the outcome is going to be. But to the degree I'm still identified with this character called me, which is pretty identified still, I'm always looking for something to get fixed here. Is all I want is peace. I don't care if my stomach hurts or not. I want to be at peace. Yes. And when we come to that place, there, uh, uh, there's a major shift in our understanding of what we're doing when we're asking for help. And what we have to look at is that I don't want it. Well, and then that My investment thereof. Okay. Exactly. You know, the big lie. Yep. And understand, literally, you want this or you want this. Okay. So in order to really, really want this, as we're talking about, it means you have to be willing to let go of your identification with you, with being right, with being special, with being different, with thinking you know your brother, what your brother's up to and understanding that means you have to, you know, like drop this, which we're not very good at yet because we're so addicted to the thought system and what it gives us. And we're afraid of the love of God because we thought we killed off God to exist in the separated state. So that's why Jesus says in the course, all I ask of you, in any given moment is the little willingness. The little willingness to drop the possibility that you think you know anything. That will help lead you to this. But even with that, we can think I want to let go and I'm willing, and yet we're sitting there cling, clinging on to what we think is important, valuable, or the way it should be, or all that kind of stuff. And so that's why it really takes a process for us to completely let this go because we don't even know what we're holding on to yet. I, I want to share something someone okay. shared. Yeah. Um, um, and it, what it reminds me of, Ken, speaking of, of how we hold on to our, <laughs> the pain and the exquisiteness the exquisiveness of just knowing that it, you know, and a connection to being alive with it. If I let this go, something so exquisite and precious. Really? Yeah. Well, and, and you know, the whole deal of this is I get to be me, you know, on this, this chart. Either God's on the throne or I'm on the throne. There isn't any other choices. And as long as I think I'm on the throne, I'm in control, I know anything, 
I've killed, God's gone. You know, he, he, he's hiding over here. So if I'm here, he's not. You know, and there's many places in the course where it talks about the idea, if there is God, there is no pain. And there is no pain. Or if there is, wait a minute, if there, if there is God, there is no pain. And if there's pain, there is no God. Well, that's because I kicked God off the throne so that I could exist. And as long as I want to exist in any aspect, I want the, I, I get this, whether I think I want this or not, I get this, but I lose all the attributes of the connection with love. And when I get tired, as I begin to become aware of this is what I got by buying the package of the ego instead of the package of the Holy Spirit, and that starts to dawn on me, this is not a very good choice. I become more willing to drop this and ask to be shown what this is. But it I don't I don't have any I don't have any understanding of what this looks like. And it's none of my business what this looks like. But when I go tired of this, my willingness to ask starts to rise, and then I will see the reflection of this in my world. Question. Yeah. You know, whenever you get into the small self there, mm -hmm. as what she was talking about, we do not, absolutely do not want to get rid of that. Mm -mm. It, it's a terribly fearful. Yes. Fear. So whenever you walk up that line where you're going to disappear, yeah. fear takes over. Absolutely. Yes, and it, it kind of brings it to the surface a little bit higher. And, we, and you have to get used to that. Yes, it takes, as we keep doing it, we eventually, I guess you could say, grow into an, um, an awareness of acceptance of that. But each step is going to be uncomfortable because we've told the world, literally, this is my home, this is what I want, this is who I am, and this is not. Yeah, so it's, we begin to drop this and choose this, we're literally going to the other team and it's very uncomfortable. And very, that, it's more than uncomfortable. Well, it's more than it can, you know, when you really touch on the terror, and I know Don, you've shared stories of yeah. your experience with that. It is terrifying. And we've all heard the story of the dark night of the soul as many uh, prophets and whatnot have talked about. What that means is I'm getting close to the memory of this. Even if I don't like a whole lot of this and I'm aware of it, I'm still terrorized of, of experiencing this. So it's a, it's a very teeter-totter kind of experience. But if we keep allowing mm -hmm. the moments when we have that little willingness to take us here, eventually this will start to have more um, validity. This will begin to have less validity and eventually we will literally just want this and we will be willing to let this go. But and that's not right now. And, and as somebody, I think it might have been Tashara, talked about the idea, we have to become aware of how we don't really want to let go of this. And Ken would repeat that over all the time. Acknowledge that you really don't want just oneness. Yeah, there's a part of me that says, yeah, this sounds good, let's go, man, I'm ready. But wait a minute, what do I have to let go of? And it's all an investment mm -hmm. in something that yeah. appears to be real. But boy, is that investment. <clears throat> Marianne? Out. Yes, go ahead, Gala. Uh, I find it helpful to um, practice being above the battleground, above the playground as much as possible. Yep. Just being aware that I'm above that floating pair of eyeballs above all of it and looking down at it and I can see both sides of you know of the dualistic there's that's a paradox there and and observe the dualism and that is helpful absolutely and that's really what the course that's is hard to get to that place though isn't it yes yeah yes <laughs> to yes get but practice on the battle practice above that. the battlefield Yes. 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 But, but yeah. Okay. I'm trying that, and it's no, it, it takes know. practice. But, but understand again, I'm either observing, I'm identifying with the decision maker, and I'm observing what's going on, 
or I'm not there and I'm here and I'm playing the part of the character called Marianne. And when I'm here, I'm part of the dualistic system, okay? There's a me against a you, okay? That's what's going on. But as Beata was saying, when I can come up here, and, and initially my coming up here is I'm still tied down to here a lot, but eventually I, I can really look and not be affected by what I'm watching because I'm really observing and not being part of it. But when I can come up here, I'm literally connecting with oneness because there's no longer two separate things. I'm looking at the whole picture, which involves two characters, but I'm no longer one of the characters. And that's our ultimate goal, is to spend more and more time observing instead of being the character. You're acting so, in the play, and yet you're also in the audience yeah. watching the play. Yeah. Watching yourself, mm -hmm. watch yourself acting in the play. And, and Ken would add just a little bit more to that. He would say, imagine you're sitting in the theater and Jesus is sitting with next Jesus, to you, right? Uh -huh. Observing the play of which you are a character. And, and I think as well, if we could think of you were the one that wrote that play, okay? You wrote that play via the uh, separation, which all the attributes of the play have to be, it really happened, it's guilt and fear, kill or be killed, and belief in separation. So if you can realize, at least intellectually, the play I'm looking at is made out of this. It's not going to be a happy, everything is wonderful all the time play. It can't be. It's made out of crap. No, <laughs> I mean, let's face it, they are the opposite of love. You're not going to find love here. But if you go, sir, pardon me? It's so I was just saying, and so looking at every little concept that tries to slip through, she ain't speaking right. I don't like her. What the fuck is she wearing her hair like that for? All those little things, questioning, you, looking. And, and, and you know, this, this is, you know, looks confusing, but th we could add a bazillion more things that we can get hooked into. Oh, well, Marianne? The world of the illusion. Yes, Bob. Marianne? Uh, uh, but I think it's very important when you're up above the battleground looking down <laughs> that, you are, that you are holding the Jesus's hand. Absolutely. Yes, Bob. That's, that's a very important part. That's absolutely correct. <coughs> it does talk about the idea that we, we want to be sure we're holding hands with, because if I'm doing it on my own, I'm, out, I'm on my own again. Right. You're in your, that you're mm. in your ego or looking down. Yeah. Ah. But yes, that's ultimately our goal is to observe the insanity that's taking place here. Because as you begin to observe, and as you know, there's some people in this group have been doing this for 30 years. So obviously they're gonna be a little bit better at observation than somebody that's brand new. That's a no brainer. But as we begin to spend more and more time here, and this line here designates the idea of out of the dream, and less and less time identified with the me, I'm going to see the world from a totally different vantage point, as opposed to just being the center of the, you know, the hero of the dream, the center of attraction that we are normally experiencing in the world. Because I'm the one, it's all about me in the world. But it's not really all about you. You're just one of the, one of the little fenced in <clears throat> bodies that can't see the whole thing because the whole thing encompasses this. We each have our own little individual lens we're looking through. And mine's little just like mm -hmm. everybody else's. But as I spend more and more time above the battleground, I'm literally starting to erase my fence. And I'm becoming a more aware of a bigger vantage point of what's really going on. And as I continue to do that, eventually, I will literally remember that I am all of it instead of the individual part of it. But that's, that, that's practice, guys. A lot of practice. Bring up a little, a it's little. Very cunning and, and very slippery. Oh, Ego is yeah. very cunning and slippery. So, you know, and it takes more than my, um, for me, I found just my uh, analogy or something, you know, something is required to really be diligent. And what is it? Painstaking about in, in my investigation of what's going on behind the curtain. Right. 
right, right, right. And the world's been here all the time telling us the stories. But as Rose was talking about the idea of the dream is an inward projection. What was the word usage? Um, an inward picture or when the world is outside a picture of an inward condition. condition. Right. Thank you, Rose. And, and literally, we didn't know how to read this. We didn't get that this is telling me a story about what my thought that was in place is all about. Because <clears throat> if it's not about love, it's not about connection but with myself and literally anything within the world, I know I'm identified with my ego. And that's not meant to make us feel worse than we already felt. It's to help us understand this has been in, in place since the Big Bang, but you were totally oblivious to it. Now we're gonna shine a light on it to help you understand it, not to make you feel worse, but to help you understand that this is the choice you've made. And it's probably not the best choice if you could choose this. And but, I love you, Marianne. Yes. Go ahead, I don't know who is speaking. And Andrea, do you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, I was just thinking about the progression maybe from before I studied the course about um, being involved in, in a situation where I, it, I was part of, the, part of the dialogue and part of the two people or the three people that were having this discussion. And I remember it, it, it took a while to, I guess, just like you say your part and then you don't, you're not happy with it. And then you go ahead and you tell someone else the story about it. And that to me was a step away from uh, it being, I'm trying, in the whole process, I'm trying in my mind or somehow to make sense of something that doesn't make sense. <laughs> and so the only way to realize that is to kind of look at it as just a story that you, a story that other people could say as well. So one of the exercises that I remember doing that really opened my eyes were to, I told about a, a situation that happened to me, but I told it in the third person. So I said, this happened, and then that happened, instead of, I said this, and I said that, and then they said this, it, because that's like one of the steps where you're trying to get rid of, you're trying to get rid of that part of you that's in pain, and you'll tell the story to someone, and someone will totally reinterpret it or they'll take your side or whatever. There's all, all some, more, some more pieces and parts to it than you ever could imagine. But when you actually write it down as something that happened, you know, in ancient history to someone that you don't, I mean, and, and you don't really, it's just what happens when you use the third person to write the story. And, and that, that was very, very helpful to me to see. And that's above the battleground. That isn't, I'm yep. no longer having the battle. And, and then I want to say something else about, about children and babies uh, being born, you know, in this, the way we are and how, um, any sense of panic or fear you would feel around the babies not being uh, um, uh, totally innocent, it has to do with the body. And the body, it doesn't mean, you know, it's kind of like we want to take some concept and just like throw it all out. So we want to throw out the body. If the body wasn't here, if this baby wasn't in the body, they would, you know, would be innocent. And, and it's, it's about the body and we can't throw any part of it out. The, the, the innocent babe or the baby who is not innocent, still that, that has, has no bearing on what we do with the baby. Right. We uh, uh, strive, we, we, we take care of the baby or, you know, many people don't take care of their babies because they expected when that body showed up, that was going to be enough and they would, you know, hop to it. Uh, and the baby wouldn't cry. And if they cry, they do weird things with it. I mean, there's all that kind of stuff going on. But it's about the body being, uh, we, we can't deny the body and we can't um, throw, the, <coughs> throw, the throw the baby out with the bath water, so to speak, or whatever. Um, that it's about our rising above the battleground, our uh, learning to ask the Holy Spirit how to work with um, the baby and the baby's spirit and their body. Like you're, Let me you're, make a suggestion, if I may, about that, with the body, how sure. you would deal with 
start thinking of yourself. I am not a body, I am free. And a practice like, uh, I say things to the kids and they think it's silly, but like I'm taking my body to the doctor this week or I'm gonna be taking my body to the dentist. So it's something that I'm doing that it's, it's not, it's not me, but it's there. It's, it must be taken care of right. in the world. Right. It's the it's same not, as I would be taking care of my car. Right, because otherwise you, uh -huh. you're in the separation. Otherwise yes. you're in the separation. You, and you, you might be thinking in the separation, but if you're not happy with that or you feel that, you know, that's not a, uh, where you want to be, then you'll, that's what makes you rise out of, that's what makes you ask the Holy Spirit for help to see it differently, whatever it is. And, and so it's not that the baby is um, a horrible creature. No, no, it's no. It's just no, the no. body. I, yeah, I it's just the body. Yeah, it's not, it didn't, you know, and it, it, is, it mostly is not aware. It has no self-awareness. Uh, uh, for until they're you know like three years old or so, there's no self, or if there is, it's very subtle. And um, you know that care that you give to them, they've learned either that you know if they anything they want, they can have if they cry, or that if they cry, sometimes they have to be you know it'll be okay. Um, anyway, I just I just feel like you know that the part about the babies was was uh. Uh, I, I think I was saying um, that the, the baby comes in to be mean because it, it's not an individual experience. It's the way this is set up. Everyone that comes here is coming from the same thought system. And yes, of course, if you're a caretaker of a small child, you would take care of them just like you would have before you heard that information. But just understand that they're not an innocent victim in the way that we think they are. They came here for a purpose just like all the rest of us did. And, you know, well, I think, at it, I think at it this don't, way. Don't take it personally, Andrea. Right, right. look at well, it this well, way. That, the mind is pretending to be a baby. The right. mind is pretending to be a five-year-old. The mind is pretending to be a teenager and on and on and on. Yeah. Ken says we come in 100% ego and the mind is, is the mind. The mind doesn't, isn't an infant. The mind's pretending it's an infant. Right. And, and it's just, not good or bad. Right, don't no. Attribute, don't right. attribute things like that to right. the ego either. It, right. it is, right. but it is. It's not good or bad. Exactly, exactly. Right. Right. I, I feel like what, though, though so what, I, I feel like, though, just that t t the balance is toward... Um, whatever is going on in the world is that's what we have to work with sure. and that's what the Holy Spirit can enter into the Holy Spirit can help us in those roles um, that's all we have we don't have any other playbook besides that we are you know full of the ego and we the only playbook is that we ask the Holy Spirit to help us and help us rise above the battleground and anybody, you know, who has a baby and thinks that they're perfect and uh, nothing, you know, that, that I mean, there I, I met a lot of people who thought their children, anything they did was just fine. And that isn't, that isn't the role either. I mean, it's just very interesting, but th there's a balance, again, to toward the Holy Spirit. If you decide that, if you want that. Yep. then you you say no you know child you can't you can't have that that's not you know for you and if they cry or whatever then that's you know what happens it's it's a, it's a balance and um anyway i just felt like we were talking a lot about the body and um we're not picking on me i promise you but know and, and and she's saying something really important mm -hmm. about being a oh. parent about being a parent. Right. Well, did I wish that I could uh, or pretend that I was a, a teenager, <laughs> but I can't. You had your chance, Bob. <laughs> my, my, my body says something entirely. I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about Bob. <laughs> right. yeah. yep, yep, yep. Or Rose or any of the characters. Yep. No, no. Mm -mm. Yep. Being the child and then the parent. 
what does Ken say? What is it? A child, a parent, a, son, a parent, and then a, a spirit. What is that? Something but Jesus was a Jesus was a child, a man, and a spirit. A child, a man, and a spirit. Yeah. And, and Helen, I, Helen wrote that. Thank you, thank you, Beata. Um, but observing a, as we are a lot today with I'm sorry, I'm going to give a um, visual there with the children that who are acting up, who are afraid misinformed and then the parent just leaves you know as a parent you know uh, the child is abandoned and learning and for me it's it's learning to be a, a parent or moving into the role uh Beata, you spoke about it the you know moving out of the battlefield and we've talked uh some other friends and i have talked about moving into the loge <laughs> yeah, isn't that beautiful? The loge, <laughs> the classy area. Yeah. Uh huh. You know, uh, where you know I'm in a different position with this, and able to react differently to the children, because that's what's happening. It's like children having a damn tantrum all over the place. I don't like. I don't want. This ain't right. They should. They shouldn't. What the fuck? It all has to do with your taking stuff personally. It doesn't have to, uh, even as a parent, it doesn't have to do with you. No. But they're doing that. Well, that you can take care of them lovingly and, and discipline them without and taking, and without being with, offended. Yes. Yeah. And that goes along with my thoughts. My thoughts yes. are my children. Yes, indeed. Very much so. Yes. Take, yes, your thoughts. Right. Am I taking Don't, them personally? Or right. watching, you know. That's so key. Yeah, it really is. And I think, you know, all the, the ideas kind of came up here, you know, journaling, stepping above the battleground, um, seeing that this is a story, watching our thinking and understanding that our thoughts are our children as well, are all really nice ways of separating from our attachment to this character that we spend so much time being attacked attached to and any type of a technique like that that can be helpful to anyone to step back a little bit from what the re reaction of being a body on planet earth are all great ways of becoming more the observer than just the character in the dream yeah. which is what we're being asked to do and, and also hone in on how personal everything is to me. Because when you're over here, there is no personal. You know, there is no something other. I am. Here, watch how quickly we get sucked into issues around, you know, they said this or they did that or they didn't do what I want them to do or all those little, and they don't have to be major big issues in your life, but just little subtle ways where the personal sh sh shines or it sticks out. Or when Tashara was commenting earlier about this idea of how much we love being a body, how I'm important, I'm valuable, and how we juice that up really good. Even if it's a, I'm in pain, there is- That's where all the drama is. The drama. All the drama is on that side. Yes. So. But these are all ways that I play the part of the hero of the dream, the central focal character that play on all the things that are happening in the world. And if we start to understand them from the perspective of this is a story about a character who believes he's separated or she's separated, who's having a dream, and look at all the things that are happening in her dream. So that's not who the character really is. And slowly, we do spend more time out of the dream, observing the dream, than we do the reactive figure in the dream. But be very aware of how much we like to be the center of attraction. You know, it's the setup of being an ego on planet Earth. Don't be surprised. Don't be disappointed. Just recognize how quickly it takes over. And, and we're addicted to this. Well, you know, the, the Ken's wife used to always say, when we had the choice between the two of these, we chose this and then we mind melded with it. This has been running the show since the Big Bang. Do you think it's got a lot of juice to it? Darn right it does. 
So anybody else have any more comments? We put so much energy. Yeah, we put so much energy and time into being an innocent victim. Oh, what in the world, <laughs> if we aren't an innocent victim, how are we going to, I guess we don't have to worry about the answer because Correct. But it just seems such an investment to be an innocent victim yes. 24 hours a day. Yes. It's a lot of work. Right. And <laughs> We don't even what would I do? Right. Well, and that's a good point. And that's another part of why this is a bit uncomfortable for us for the most part, because we're addicted to this. We're used to this, even if it's horrible and awful most of the time. You know, I'm pretty familiar with that. And you want me to drop this to find out what that is? I don't know if I trust you yet. And again, the reason why Jesus uses the words, the little willingness, because he's, he's asking in this instant, are you willing? to release or relinquish your investment in what you think is right. And I'll show you what the answer is. And, and when you come through that ordeal of, oh my God, what am I going to do? And you come through it and there's this answer you get, this something gets cleared up totally that you have no way of being involved in and knowing about. Then you have something to go on. And when you have that, it doesn't matter if you reincarnate yesterday or you uh, turn the car over. It doesn't matter if, if the sky falls. Nothing matters because the miracle shows the truth. And you go, well, look at that. And it doesn't, none of that other stuff, how many, how many indulgences do you get for 30 days or, you know, all those questions about what's going to happen next and what, what, when I die, that's, that's when you see, you understand that none of those things make it mean anything. And, and that's what really, uh, um, finally, um, hooks, hooks me to this course is, well, for heaven's sakes, I could never I never thought this would work out, but I gave up on it. And I said, God help me. I can't do this. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't do this with this child. I can't do this with my mother. I can't, I just can't figure, I just can't, this doctor's telling me to do these things and I don't want to do it. What can I do? And it's amazing. I mean, then when you get that answer, you get off all those questions about, well, how, you know, how long is it going to last? And when I die, what's going to happen next? And who's going to play Pinochle in heaven or whatever, you know, it's just really interesting that that's where, you know, the, the rubber meets the road and you just take off. It's really, um, that's the whole answer. Of course, that's the miracle is, is the answer. Thank you. Really a good point. Um, Andrea, you know, when, when you have those experiences and you know the, you know, you see that the answer doesn't come from you, it comes from an awareness outside of you. And usually it brings forth an answer that's so far beyond what you could have figured out in your limited understanding that you start to trust that more. And then all the questions that we all have, which we all seem to have and we will have within the context of the dream will start to fade away as well because what, what do I need all those answers from when I, my only real answer is oh, but then again we also all of us have have the same dream yes and we just interpret the dream in, in the different ways correct and in form it's different but in content it's identical Bob. right and, and, and also that uh, uh, I'm glad that I'm not a victim because now it puts me in control and I say, wow. But still, I find myself a lot of times slipping into being a victim and I got to say, hey, wait a minute. Yes. No, you, no, you're no victim. You were okay. getting exactly what you want. Right. And I think we eventually start to realize I don't really enjoy being a victim anymore. This really right. isn't serving me. And we're more willing to let go of that in order to find out what, what is really going on. And I can take these stuff you know, that I feel as though I'm a victim in and use them for an entirely different purpose. Absolutely correct. Anybody else before we go on? Any voices. So I'm going to mute everybody because I think we got a bunch of people that are unmuted and where I can hear some background sounds. So, all right. 
Okay, so we're in paragraph three. So the body is a dream. Like other dreams, it sometimes seems to picture happiness, but can quite suddenly revert to fear where every dream is born. And again, the idea, every dream is born from fear because we chose the opposite of love. The opposite of love is guilt, sin, and fear. So the dream originates from the concept of guilt, sin, and fear. For only love creates in truth, and truth can never fear. So if we had stayed in truth, truth wouldn't exist. So if we're looking for the answer of what life would be like without fear, we can't look in the context of a world of fear and find the answer. It doesn't exist there. It's only when we're willing to drop this to recognize there's another way that we can then be shown an experience where fear does not live. Made to be fearful, must the body serve the purpose given it? Okay, so it was made to be fearful, and the body is going to serve that purpose because that's the body was meant to keep this thought system hidden. So that's it's going to play out in those ways. But there's just enough good stuff within the plan that we've been duped. We've been duped into believing. If I you know, run towards something good or I run away from something that's not good, I'm going to solve the problem within the illusion. And it's a trick because if we run from something or we're running to something, we're not in the moment and where the answer can really be found. But we've been duped for a very long time into thinking I can figure this out. But we can change the purpose that the body will obey by changing what we think that it is for. And again, we set it up so that the body would be an innocent victim. Everything outside of me would be the perpetrators. And if it wasn't for them, I could be at peace. But the deal is, if I was truly at peace, nothing in the world could ever disturb my peace. So it doesn't have anything to do with what's happening in the world that's destroying my peace. What already destroyed my peace was the choice for separation, of which I now pretend I'm the innocent victim of, but that's not true. So if anything can trigger you uh, an experience of lack of peace, know that you were never really at peace or couldn't do that. Okay, and I know, again, that's another a realization of the course that can be a little bit hard to take initially, but what's really trying to help us understand is you weren't at peace, you put the garbage in somebody else, you played the part of an innocent victim, and now when they show up to disturb your peace, you point the finger at them saying, if it wasn't for them, I could be okay. But the answer doesn't lie there. The answer lies with, as long as this thought system is in gear, this one is not, and this is what's going to run the show. And it's gonna present itself in all kinds of specific ways within the play of the world. Okay, on to paragraph four. The body is the means by which God's son returns to sanity. Though it was made to fence him into hell without escape, yet has the goal of heaven been exchanged for the pursuit of hell. Son of God extends his hand to reach his brother and to help him walk along the road with him. Now is the body holy. Now it serves to heal the mind that, may, that it was made to kill. All right. So the body is meant, excuse me, the body is the means by which the son returns to sanity. And again, I mentioned at the beginning a little bit about the body and how we don't want to ignore the, our body and our body reactions. Because what it's saying is the body is the means. In other words, this is the way we're going to find our, the Son of God is going to return to sanity. Because we're going to use what the body was set up by the ego to do, but we're going to use it for a different purpose rather than having somebody disturb my peace, which I'm going to attack, and then I'm going to feel guilty because I attack them. I'm going to use what my brother presents to me as a means of understanding that if I've lost my peace, 
it means I've chosen for the ego. And if I've chosen for the ego, if and when I'm ready, I can drop it and choose to connect with the Holy Spirit. But it really has nothing to do with the things on the outside. All those were, were triggers that pushed my doorbell or my button. But my button couldn't have been um, poked or um, bumped or whatever unless I had the doorbell in my mind which was the choice for the separation. Though it was made to fence him into hell without escape, yet has the goal of heaven been exchanged for the pursuit of heaven. So again, now I'm using what was, is being presented to me in the world for a totally different purpose. It's not about avoiding or pretending this isn't here. It's about using it for a different purpose. The Son of God extends his hand to reach his brother and to help him walk along the road with him. So if my brother's not the problem, okay, and I know that's not always, well, I shouldn't say not always, it's very seldom ever our immediate response to an irritation that appears to occur through a brother or through something else in the world, is to recognize that's not the real representation of who they are. They are what I want them to be so I can play the part of an innocent victim. Then I look at them and recognize they are only representing what I want them to represent because I chose for separation and I feel guilty for having chosen that separation. So when you now extend your hand to your brother and ask, I want to see my brother through your eyes, Holy Spirit, and th instead of through the limited lens of which I have chosen to see my brother. Then I drop my investment in what I set up in the ego, and I open the door to a possibility of seeing my brother from a totally different perspective. And here we're joined, here we're separate. Now is the body holy? Not because the body in and of itself is anything, because as we've talked many times, the body is simply a puppet. And it's a puppet that's even either run by the ego or it's run by the Holy Spirit. It's now holy because the body is being used through the puppeteer of love instead of the puppeteer of guilt, sin, fear, and separation. Okay, my tart's falling over. All right, this isn't working too good, but we'll get it together. <laughs> All right. There we go. That's better. Um, so we use the body for a totally different pur purpose, and then the puppeteer will follow along, and it will be operated through the Holy Spirit instead of being operated through the ego. All right, where were we? And he's telling us when we allow ourselves to do that, we are now exchanging hell for, for heaven. Just like the opposite when we set this up originally was we set it up because we believed in the opposite. We believed it, we assumed it was our experience now, and we forgot what truth was. So now we're shifting gears and we're making it go back to where it came from in the first place. Son of God extends his hand to reach his brother and help him walk. So our brother or the circumstances outside of our seeming mind are all the ways that we are reminded that we need to ask for healing. You will identify with what you think will make you safe. Well, as long as I want to be separated, I want to be in charge, I want to be an individual, I want to be special, what is my safety lies in the belief of this, of this thought system. So as we talked about before, I love the pain, I love the irritation, I love the, all the things that make me an innocent victim. In fact, I can't live without them. Because in order to have a kill or be killed world, there has to be an innocent victim and there has to be a perpetrator. So we pay a very high price to be an innocent victim. 
but it's important to understand I feel like my safety lives here and because I'm afraid of the love of God that's not where I'm safe because he's gonna come and get me so I play this game trying to manipulate this world in hopes that I will be able to maintain my innocent victimness and the perpetrators won't be who I am but the perpetrator really represents that belief that I carry in my mind. Now is the body holy. Now it serves to heal the mind that it was made to kill. And understand this thought system was an effect of a choice for the opposite of love. We killed off love to exist in this seeming experience. Though the Course would say many times, many places, it seems to be real, it's not real, but to the degree that we are invested in the belief that it's real, which is a lot because we've been investing in it since the Big Bang. You know, some of you uh, invest in stocks and whatever. If you've been investing in stocks for, since the Big Bang, you can be sure your investment is very heavy into the belief system of what we have accepted. Even if it's not true, we've invested in it. And now we're going to use it to heal instead of kill. Because kill does not live here. Only oneness lives here. There's nothing to kill over here. It's only here where that concept of kill or be killed, me against you, and all the ways that duality get played out in the world. All right, so on to paragraph number five. You will identify with what you think will make you safe. Whatever it may be, you will believe that that is one with you. Your safety lies in truth, not in lies. Love is your safety. Fear does not exist. Identify with love and you are safe. Identify with love and you are home. Identify with love and find yourself, capital S. So again, you will identify with what you think will make you safe. But one of the challenges we have, especially as we initially begin to practice the course, and when I say initially, that could be 40 or 50 years, not just a brand new student, because we're so addicted to the thought system of the ego, we still think that this is where our safety lies, because we're afraid of this. And that's why as we have the little willingness of when we start to choose this, this starts to build in our investment and this starts to wane. But initially, this is my enemy, not my, my it's my opposition because I have accepted this is my reality. Whatever it may be, you will believe that it is one with you. So again, it's either one with me as my choice for the ego or it's one with me in choice of, this, of the uh, connection with oneness. But I have to truly accept and believe that this is really all I want. And that's why we continue to go back and forth initially, which can, as I said, go for a long time. Yeah, you leaving, Bob? <laughs> Got something? We can't hear you. <clears throat> Um, look for the little um, speaker at the bottom left. It should say mute. Click on that and it'll, or mute or unmute. Can you see it? <laughs> Where's Pat when you need her, huh? Well, I can unmute everybody and then everybody else. All right, let's see. Got it? No? It should be on the scroll bar at the very bottom, Bob, in the bottom left-hand side. No. Nope. Doesn't go off. Oh, it's off. You're good. Oh, okay. Okay, now if I can remember what yeah, I was going to exactly. say. Now that the ego has, um, has no power. The only power it has is a power we give it. Yes. And I find that to be very important. And I find that, again, it puts me in control. Yes. The only problem is we've given it a whole lot of power. Yes, yes, you yes. Can now, it, you know, stop giving it more power and start investing in the power of our right. truth. Yes. yes, yeah. Okay. 
I have a Ken quote from that. Yes, go for it. <laughs> and I have a big question mark. It's like, huh? <laughs> and doubting that I wrote it right. So I'll read it and you can say more about it, Marianne. Okay. You hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Body is not the problem. Ooh, bottom is not the body is not the problem. The thought that made them, that's the problem. Correct. Right. But as the way this is set up, is I don't remember that it was the thought that made the body important. I just know. I believe the body's important. And that's why this whole concept we're discussing is so valuable and important because we have mind melded with the body and the characteristics of me in relationship to the world. When in truth, the problem lies here. It has nothing to do with anything that's going on here. But there's so many avenues that we hook onto and spend all our time trying to fix or change or make different that it's just a road to nowhere. So it's just the thought or the thinking. Absolutely. And that's what I'm always looking at and questioning, the thought and thinking. Yes. And, you know, the couple of workbook lessons, I think 79 and 80, I'm, there, what is it? There's one problem, one solution. The problem is we believe we separated from love. The answer is we didn't. But in the world, as I identify with the character called me, called the hero in this case, you know, the problem is this person, the problem is the coronavirus, the problem is this, I'm getting old, the problem is something on the outside world. But that's never where the problem is. The problem is always in the mind that believes it's separated. And always the thought or the concept that I'm believing about it. Correct. This is a problem. Something is wrong. Yep. And this is more significant or real than yes. God. And that's what's giving it power, is, is my, my attention to it, my belief in it. Yeah. That is me. That's the power I'm giving it. If I can just watch it and not attach, which is what the Holy Spirit has help, help, helps me do, right. then it, it has no power. Yeah. Don't judge it. Yeah. Question, like Tashara said, question, yes. is this true? And it really is, you know, this is sort of like in a circular kind of um, display. Think of the whole dream as a, as a balloon. We know if you had a pen, you could pop it in, it would just fizzle off into nothingness. Well, it's our investment in the belief that it's real, which it was set up in a very solid manner to keep us stuck here, but it's still not real. But every ounce of who we think we are believes I'm real, the world is real, and these things and these people and these circumstances and situations definitely can take my peace away. And it's, that's why it's a bit of a challenge for us to you know, kind of rise above the battleground because this has been made to be extremely solid. And the course even describes it. It's a citadel, you know, it's, it's, it's got, you know, people around it to protect it and whatever. Still not real. It's still not real. All right, so line three, paragraph five. Your safety lies in truth and not in lies. Well, this is the lies. All of it's a lie. It's just that we've invested in that lie for so long, we think it's not just not just not a lie we think it's our very existence and there's nothing outside that existence love is your safety and what he means by love is connecting with truth fear does not exist you know whenever we are at oneness fear didn't live there wasn't a word in the vocabulary of this part of our mind that exists it was only after the belief in separation took place that there was a concept of guilt sin and fear it didn't exist over here it only began to exist as we chose for this. Identify with love and you are safe. It's not a pretend safety that keeps my ego going. It's an understanding of who I am that can't be disturbed or, or be taken away any longer by anything outside of what it is. Identify with love and you are home. We're at our real home, our, our, our only home. And there are a number of places throughout the course where it talks about the fact that we all feel like we're an alien here. 
well, we are an alien here, but we don't get that we're an alien here. And we certainly don't get we're an alien here because we chose to be an alien here. We wanted it our way. We wanted to be in charge. We wanted to be God. And to relinquish that, to allow God to flow through is what we have to be, be doing. And we have to become aware of all the many ways that we get hooked into the dream and believing that it is what reality is. Uh, uh, but if we really look at ourselves and look deep, we really feel as though we really don't belong here. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I think we all as young people even real thought there's something wrong. I don't know what it is. I right. don't, I don't, I can't put my finger on it, but something's not right. And, you know, we, we spent most of our life focusing on stuff to keep us going to survive, but it's, it's never going to be right because it's not right. You know, and it, and it starts even with families. I don't know about some, but with families where we feel like I don't belong here or these, what, who are these people? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. All right, so identify with love and find your self, capital S. So when we drop this, and again, we start by being aware of it, by, by, by watching the stories, by being aware of what, what this investment in the ego has brought us. But as we're doing that, we're literally not feeding it anymore. Because if you're identified with this character, you're not identified outside of the dream. When you're identified outside, you're not identified with the character. So the more we spend observing, you know, with the Holy Spirit or Jesus sitting there holding our hands, the more we're not feeding into this any longer. And we'll eventually choose to connect with our true self, capital S self, instead of our little S self. We have just a couple more. And then there's... Go ahead. Go ahead. But there's just, there, there's really no way of, of, of reaching the Holy Spirit unless we go through the, the, the bodily things we, we go through. So, so we, we, each, each individual thing is different. And watching um, for the first time, I mean, I know this man across the street uses uh, um, weed killer and stuff on his grass, and, he, and he, I know he watched him doing all that, and I'm sitting across the street with my, um, I guess, so to speak, organic garden, and thinking, oh, he's releasing all that stuff into the air, and I said, and it, it did, it, it pushed a big button, and I said, okay, Jesus, help me with this one. I don't know what this, I can't. And I, if I'm not a body, I sure feel like one and I don't want to inhale all that stuff. He's uh, spraying. I said, okay, God, Jesus, I need help. I, I want to, I mean, in that instant, I am totally flummoxed and uh, perturbed and angry. And I say, if this is, uh, you know, you got to help me with this one even harder because I don't understand it. You know, he, he shouldn't be putting that stuff on his grass well. So, and then that's where I am. And I wait and I ask because I, I mean, other people go over there and say, put that stuff away and stop poisoning my air. Or, I mean, there's all kinds of aggravation that you're uh, experiencing. And if the answer is, Jesus, help me. I, I, I want to see this differently. And then I went in the house. So well, but it, and, it, it, it's and, a big deal when it's going yep. on. Yep. It, it, it's a big deal. You're, and isn't that a perfect um, example of forgiveness? I look, I wait, and judge not. Yep. Yep. And, you know, I always say it's not really a classroom unless it hits below the belt. You know, Andrea can be pretty nice most of the time, but wait a minute, they start spraying and watch the, watch the monster come out. And we all have our specific places where our internal monster comes out. And the Course is trying to help us understand, even in those moments, even if everything you've read, everything within the context of the world says, that's a bad thing, and I have a right to attack my brother under those circumstances, the Course is asking us to step back, as you were saying, Andrea, and wait a minute, I don't really know the answer to this. 
Now at the foundation years ago, um, many of the staff used to smoke. And then we'd be in this big, like a cafeteria room. And on the one end, that staff would, would sit and they would be smoking away. And um, oftentimes people that came to the classes, well, why can't you make them stop? And Ken would smile at them and say, that's not where the problem lies. And most people didn't get what he was saying. But what he was saying is the problem isn't the outside world, no matter how solid, no matter how realistic, no matter how much proof you have that you're right and they're wrong, ask to see it through his eyes instead of yours. But that takes a lot, guys. It takes a lot because we think we are so right in every situation. But we're not, necess we're not right in this way of seeing what the situation is. If I'm wrong all the time, oh, who am I? A wrong person. <laughs> but you're not even the person that you think you are that thinks it's wrong. Because there is no person called Bob here. And that's one of the challenges we have, because Bob still wants to be Bob. And you'd rather be Bob wrong than not be at all. And that's, you know, that's one of the, the strings that tie us pretty tight to this as well. That's why I had the fear. Of course. And, and more so than we're even, even the slightest bit aware of. That's it's so deeply seated. You know, the roots of that belief system are down pretty far. Because I think I am the body. Yes, sirree. And again, that's the big catch. I think I am the body. I think I'm the hero of this dream. That's huge in this storyline. You know, there, in, we read, you know, in, in the hero of the dream, which we obviously didn't get to today, but um, the body is the central figure in the dreaming of the world. There is no dream without it. You know? The body is not the problem. And the body is never, ever, ever, ever the problem, nor are any other bodies or any other things that seem to be the problem. The problem lies above or before this story even showed up. So that, how this be that's not what I believe. No, and that's absolutely that's true. the trouble. Yes, and that's can, the trouble. Bob. We can, we can talk true. talk about it all day, but deep down in, yeah. it's not what I believe. Yeah. And it's so interesting. It is so interesting, and uh, oh my goodness, amusing to see that it's the thought and the mind and the slipperiness. It becomes like it becomes like a a serial, you know, a show again, you know. Yeah, and what and what do you do when you're watching another series? You fall into the trap of the story, and then you're dead brain dead all over again. Yes, yeah, yeah. And you know that again is just the progression. We're addicted to this, so we easily get pulled into it. We choose one time, and then we're back in here digging away, and whatever the next thing that shows up. And slowly, we will begin to apply this to no matter what happens in our lives. But that's a process. That's not our natural response. Our natural response is kill or be killed, fall into the trap. And we do it ever so wonderfully because we're addicted to doing it that way. It really can't be any other way, but now that we understand there is another way and we're willing to work through it, even a little bit once in a while, we're making great strides and great progress of the undoing process that I continue to give my power away. Exactly. And literally, if we're giving our power to this or to anything within the world, anything that has to do with time, space, or form, we are giving our power away. Right. We're saying, I am something less than what I really am. I am a victim. Yep. And I can only be a victim if I have a victimizer. Can't play the game any other way. And I could find them. <laughs> and well, whether you look for them or not, they'll show up at your door because that's the setup. And they're coming to your door or you'll find them because you put them there. We projected that into the world and made them the, the problem so I could play the part of an innocent victim. They will show up until our mind is healed. You know, they talk about the you, you can fool everyone, but you can't fool mom. Well, with this plan, you can't fool the universe because the universe is an outpouring 
of the thought that's being held in the mind. And if the thought being held in the mind is guilt, sin, and fear, separation, it's going to project into the world. It can't not. It's unavoidable. And so then, again, if we use it for a different purpose, we can then begin to use the world as our awareness. Oh, there I go again. I got pulled in. Ooh, that it's one got a blessing. Me. What's that? And that's a blessing. And that's a blessing. That's not only is it a blessing, Bob, it's our salvation as the course described, because without it, I wouldn't know what was going on in my mind. So again, my brother be begins to be my salvation when I use him properly, because I wouldn't know what was going on without him. And that's pretty amazing, considering the fact that we have dumped all our garbage on our brother since the beginning of time and made our brother guilty so we could appear to be innocent. So that's, that's, that's quite a gift our brother's giving us in spite of the fact of what we've been doing to him. And of course, we're all collectively doing this. So we're all just bouncing off each other all the time. Yep. Alrighty, I think it's about that time. So again, I will mute the button and we'll read the closing prayer. And then I will unmute if anybody wants to stay on and has any comments or questions. So let me mute. Okay, so once again, if you could just close your eyes and take a nice big deep breath. Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you, in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given, and accept but this into the minds which you've created and which you love. Amen. Thanks, Marianne, and thanks, everybody. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Have a great Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Welcome. welcome.